Well, good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church of Mishawaka. I'm going to begin by reading to you Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Psalm 46 was Martin Luther's inspiration as he wrote the Reformation hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. We're going to be singing that in just a moment. But this, this service that we're celebrating this morning is a remembrance of what happened 502 years ago, which is generally considered the start of the Protestant Reformation, recovering the great truths of our salvation, that we are saved by faith alone. And this morning as we're singing, you can pick out those truths, those different Reformation truths in the songs that we will be singing. But first, let's bow our heads and our hearts together in prayer for the service. Our God, we thank you that you have loved us so much that you sent your Son to die in our place. And that through faith in him, we are now your sons and daughters. We will live forever with you. We thank you that you cared enough about us to work through men and women, several hundred years ago, to recover the truths of our salvation from those who sought to adulterate it. And I pray that this morning as we sing, we would sing praise to you, rejoicing in what you have accomplished in our hearts, and looking forward to what you have to say to us in your word. So please bless this service. May you receive the glory through it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you please stand together with us? We'll sing together, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
Gentlemen, if you would go ahead and come down to the front as we receive our tithes and offerings for the morning. As they come, would you bow your head with me in prayer? Lord, our Father, we are humbled and grateful, Lord, that you chose to use uh, certain men so long ago, Lord, to proclaim and, Lord, make famous your truths, even though it was amidst, Lord, intense persecution at times. Even today, Lord, you, you choose to uh, use feeble people like us, Lord, to proclaim these same truths to the world around us. Lord, I pray that as we go through our days and our weeks, Lord, I pray that we would, Lord, champion your word in everything we do and make it a priority first in everything we do. Lord, I pray that you would bless these offerings that today, and it's the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.
living hope, which portrays the truths that we've talked about with the Reformation. How Jesus, how God the Father reached out towards us and offered salvation and provided everything necessary. Let's sing together, Living Hope.
please read together with me the italicized verses of Scripture. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But if the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also, it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Let's sing together, not in me.
word this morning. Father, we trust by faith that what we see in this world around us, everything and every person, you created, and you created for your glory. And we confess, Father, that we have failed, we have sinned, we have separated ourselves from you, and we have marred our own purpose on this earth. But we give you thanks, Father, that you loved us first, that you sent your son Jesus to save us. We thank you that through faith in him, we have the ability as we cooperate with your spirit to be sanctified, to be growing, and to once again reflect the way that you called us to, your own presence, your own glory in this world that you've created. And I pray that our church, First Baptist Church of Mishawaka, would be filled with God-glorifying people who seek to magnify you in their places of work, in their homes, in their neighborhoods, that our church might be a light to this community, that you have loved this world, that you have acted to bring about our salvation. And I pray that we might have the privilege to be a part of your saving mission to this earth by bearing witness and testimony to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray that as our pastor comes and preaches the truth of the word of God this morning, that we might have ears to hear and hands and feet to obey, that we would be committed to persevering in the truth that you reveal to us in your word. May you be glorified through the change that happens in our lives, through the working of your spirit with the word. To the glory of Christ we pray. Amen. If you're able to, would you please join us in standing once more? We'll sing one final song before the message. My faith.
thank you for your singing this morning. You may be seated. Our scripture reading for the morning will be from Colossians chapter 4. Finishing out the book of Colossians. We're going to read verses 10 through verse 18. Colossians 4, 10 through 18. If you would follow along in your copy of scripture. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him, and Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. Hey, and looking good down here. <laughs> and when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read from the letter, uh, lead the letter from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, See that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. It's just like Nate to want to get his word in anywhere he's at. So. <laughs> we are going to finish up Colossians today. And uh, as I said last week... Um, I debated how to handle this last section, and, and I decided to divide it up into two sections, and as I was studying this week, I was like, whew, this is a lot to get through in one week, so we're going to do our best, and uh, we can't get into great detail about everything, but um, I think it'll, uh, it'll, could, it will still be a challenge to you. I, I do want you to be aware of something coming up in just a few weeks. This is not in our bulletin, but uh, as Pastor was up here, I was reminded of this. On November 16th, we are going to be having an uh, ordination council assemble, and uh, Will is going to be standing before the ordination council, and uh, he is going to be uh, asked a lot of questions about the doctrinal statement that he has written, and uh, that, this is a, a great opportunity in the life of a, a young pastor to um, do, really be challenged and questioned on his, on his faith and what he believes uh, according to the Bible. Uh, I encourage you, uh, you are all welcome to come that. That is Saturday, that is on a Saturday, and uh, we'll have more information coming, but to encourage you to come. Uh, there will be pastors gathered from churches all over that will come and ask them questions. You can, can't ask questions, but you can come and listen, and I think you'd learn a lot. Uh, I'll just prepare you. Usually these are about two, three hours long of questioning, so if you say, I was thinking it would be a half hour, you probably shouldn't come. But if you are okay with that, it's, it's just a great time. And then on Sunday, we would uh, come together and celebrate that together. So there'll be more information. I want you to be aware of that coming up. Uh, Colossians, uh, as we come to an end, I just wanted to give an overview, a reminder of where we've been. And I want to I kind of summarize Colossians in just three simple words. I say simple because it's only three. These are not simple words, though. Uh, sovereignty. Sufficiency and identity. Sovereignty means that, and we studied this in Colossians, that Jesus is God and he is equal to God. And this was revealed in the fact that the Bible says, Colossians says, that Jesus created all things, sustained all things. And because of that, he is over all things, which makes him sovereign. Jesus is also sufficient, meaning that since he is God, since he is fully God, he offers to us all that we need to, to live in this world, and so he is sufficient. And if we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, then Jesus tells us that we are to put away the old man, and the new man is put on, and, and therefore we have a new identity in Christ. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about that through chapters 3 and 4, uh, but that's just a bit of a review. As I said last week, this book ends with just some introductions and greetings. Um, it's interesting to see if you read through Paul's letters, how many times he mentions 
co-workers. Uh, he mentions people who have come alongside of him. And it's, it, it's interesting, he's talking about how many people have served with him. He does not view them as inferiors. He calls them co-workers, fellow laborers, fellow servants. Throughout all of Paul's letters, in fact, if you, if you um, tabulate all the names, put them all together, it's, it, it, you, there's about a hundred individuals that are mentioned throughout Paul's letters. I'm sure he had far more than that serving with him, but that's quite a few. Now, some of them you know a lot about. Timothy, Barnabas, some of them you don't know hardly anything about, including some of the ones that we'll mention today. But it kind of reminds me of the idea that ministry is, is people working together. People working together for the glory of God. We do not all have the same talents. We do not all have the same responsibilities. But the ministry of God, and specifically the ministry of First Baptist Church, cannot function the way it, God wants it to without everyone participating. Without everyone having a part. It doesn't matter if the youngest all the way up to the oldest. God is gearing us. God is training us. God is working us towards the place that we will serve Him faithfully. And God wants every single person to contribute. There's a major uh, source of frustration for many pastors, uh, and, and that is the, something called the, the 80 20 principle. Now, I don't know if this is applicable here in our church, but the 80 20 principle basically says this in churches. 20% of the people in church do 80% of the work. Again, I don't know if that's the way it is here, but in many churches that's the case. And, and for a pastor, at times that can be frustrating because uh, you, we need more people to be involved in that. And typically you have 20% doing 80% of the work, and, and those 80% come to church, attend church, enjoy the service, and leave without really getting involved. The church is called the body of Christ, and and all parts of the body are to, to work towards the health of the church. Can you imagine what it would be like if your body was 80% paralyzed? I mean, quadriplegics can function and, and can even be productive and have meaningful lives, but, but they're limited in what they can do. And churches can limp along with only 20% of the body functioning, but they will do so much more for the glory of God if every member is fully engaged in what God calls them to do. And as we look at this passage, I, uh, I, again, as I said last week, I do not believe Paul wrote this greeting at the end to teach us lessons. I believe Paul wrote this as, as to introduce and to, to greet. Okay, but I believe as we look at this and as we think about the church and church ministry, and as we think about uh, the, the place that each person has, I think what we see is, is that, that there, there is different types of people and different types of responsibilities that each of us have in the church. And so what I want to look at this morning is I want to look at some different types of people that are involved in Paul's ministry and, and are involved in our ministry as well. And I, I'm not saying that these type are the only type of people in the church. What I'm saying is these are the ones that Paul had around him and that he mentions. And I think there are lessons that we can learn from. Some of them are positive, but not all of them are. And, and, and because our knowledge is limited about these individuals, I am going to pull from other passages of Scripture so that we understand more about these individuals. Let's begin with a word of prayer. God, we are thankful that we can be here and study these individuals and study how uh, they had a big part in Paul's ministry. And oftentimes we think of a, a guy like the Apostle Paul as, as some saintly person who, who did so much for you, but the reality was this. Paul couldn't have did what he did without these faithful, faithful servants. So Lord, I pray that you help us each person in here to, to ask you today, how can I faithfully serve you? How can I be a part of this ministry at First Baptist Church even more than I am now? And Lord, I pray that you help us to be people who um, serve tirelessly for your glory. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, longer outline today than maybe I sometimes have, but there's uh, eight individuals, eight types of individuals that I believe the church ministry has and that I want to address. The first one is the church ministry thrives with encouraging people. Look back at the text that Pastor Will read. Look at verse 10. Uh, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barmas, concerning whom you have received instruction, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice. 
These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have become a com or have been a comfort to me. Now, in these first two verses, Paul includes three guys, and these are three guys that are they're basically while Paul's writing, they're sitting next to him. Okay, and so he's writing this, and he's and he's telling them these things, and then he says, okay, okay, before I wrap up, there's these three people that want to greet you. Now, under this first point, I want to address two of them. I'm going to save the next one for the next point. But uh, there's two guys I want to point out. First one is Aristarchus. Again, not a name that you say very often, is it? I don't think you know of anyone named Aristarchus except for this guy. Okay? Aristarchus is only mentioned three times in, in, in the whole Bible. Okay? The first time we see Aristarchus is actually a, a pretty scary story that we often just go by. Okay, Paul is in, the, is in the city of Ephesus, and he's coming there, and he's preaching. And, and as was many, many times the case, when Paul would go into an area, he would preach. And usually what would happen is the Jews in that area would kind of stir up strife a little bit. And so Paul is in uh, Ephesus, and these Jews are stirring up strife, so much so that a riot breaks out. And you read about it in Acts, uh, Acts chapter 19. And then riot breaks out, and these people are running on. I mean, you can picture riots, okay? We've had them here in our country from time to time. But a riot breaks out, and I'm sure storefronts are being destroyed, and houses are being destroyed, and, and, uh, and all these things are taking place. And in the midst of it, one of the rioters sees Aristarchus, a guy by the name of Gaius, and says, I think these people are with Paul. And so the Bible tells us, and you can look this up, in Acts chapter 19, verse uh, 29, these rioters grab Aristarchus, and all it tells us in the Bible, we don't know the total outcome, but all it tells us is they grab Aristarchus and drag him around the city and out the city. So the first time we see this guy is not a good thing. Okay, he's near death, I'm assuming, but uh, um, we see him here. Now, he doesn't die. How do we know that? Because we see him in the next chapter in Acts. If you remember last week, we talked about Tychicus, and we said Tychicus was, uh, went with Paul from uh, Asia Minor down to Jerusalem. Remember, the, the people in Asia Minor, the Christians, had, had raised up money to help the needy people in, in, in uh, Jerusalem. And so Paul was going to go down and deliver, but he wanted to take some, some Christians from Asia Minor with him. And so he took Tychicus, we talked about him last week, but you can see in Acts chapter 20, he also took Aristarchus. Okay, so we can see this is a guy who faithfully went with Paul. We also see at some point in Acts, it tells us that he traveled with Paul uh, um, um, to Rome. He was on the ship with Paul as they traveled to Rome. He refers to him here as a fellow prisoner. Now, there's some question about what he means about that. A lot of times when Paul talks about someone being a fellow prisoner or, or a, a fellow servant, he's referring, usually he adds a little phrase at the end that says, in Christ. Meaning, I'm not, I'm not talking about literal chains, I'm not talking about literal bondage, but he's saying uh, uh, there's, there's something, uh, it's, it's the idea that we have placed ourselves under Christ and we are his servants. Well, what's interesting is this particular phrase here does not use that additional phrase. Also, the phrase that's used here usually implies a literal prison. And so Aristarchus, for whatever reason, in Rome here, is a fellow prisoner of Paul. He was arrested for whatever reason, maybe proclaiming the gospel, it doesn't tell us, but he is in prison. Okay, so that's this guy, Aristarchus. The second one I want you to notice, look at verse 11. And Jesus, who is called Justice... Jesus was a very common name. It wasn't until later when uh, there started to be this um, conflict between Jews and, and Christians where the name Jesus become, uh, became a less used name. But at this time, Jesus was still a very common name. And so there's this guy named Jesus, or some called him Justice. Uh, really, we don't know much about him. Okay, all we know is uh, from the implication here is that he's a Jew. But other than that, we don't know anything about him. We don't see him anywhere else in Scripture. However, I do want you to notice what it says at the end of verse 11 about Aristarchus, Mark, who we'll talk about in a minute, and about justice. At the end of verse 11, it says this, They have been a comfort to me. See, Paul surrounded himself with people who, who impacted his ministry. And these three guys, and, and, and probably in their own different ways, had been a comfort to him. Now, the word that is used here is, is, uh, is a word that could also be tra translated encouraged. If you remember back, look at back at verse 8. Last week we talked about Tychicus, 
And Paul says, I've sent Tychicus to be an encouragement to you. These two words are two different words, but yet very similar. Okay, both of them have, in, in the Greek, they both have the beginning, the same beginning, which means to come alongside. But the one last week was to come alongside and build up. This one's different. This one is to come alongside and soothe or calm or encourage. To come alongside and, and pacify. Basically what Paul is saying is, is these guys here, they have come alongside me and they have, they, have, they have been a comfort and a calming factor to me. They have been encouragement to me. You know, that, that, we need people like that in the church. We need people who are going are gonna to come alongside other people and, and, and encourage them, but comfort them, soothe them. I'm sure that as, as Paul was going through these hard times, these individuals were there. And, and, and when, when Paul was suffering physically or when Paul was facing these problems in jail, and I'm sure there was down days for Paul. I'm sure there was days where Paul wept. I'm sure there's days where Paul struggled. And these three guys came along inside and, and empathized with him and, and, and just loved him and, and, and said, Paul, we're, we're here for you. Uh, and whatever trial you go through, we're going to be there. And Paul says these three guys were such a soothing, calming effect in his life. Who in this church needs a soothing, calming person? And you can be that person. Second type of person that we see is, and I want to jump back now to this guy, Mark. If you look in verse 10, it says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greet you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. He mentions Mark here. Now, sometimes Mark is referred to as John or John Mark. Um, John Mark had a very different type of ministry path than Tychicus that we talked about last week and Aristarchus. Those two guys were just faithful, faithful dudes. I mean, they were the guys that were by Paul's side every step of the way. That's not John Mark. John Mark traveled with Paul and Barnabas on the very first missionary journey. Now, as it says here, uh, John Mark was Barnabas' cousin. And so uh, it came time for that first missionary journey. And Barnabas says, hey, here's my cousin. He's, he, he's a good guy. He, he loves the Lord. Let's bring him along. And Paul says, sure. But somewhere along the way during that missionary journey, John Mark deserted them. He left them. And that, that departure became a source of, of friction between Paul and Barnabas, so much so that the time came for their second missionary journey, and they're gathering their team together, and Barnabas says, I want to bring along John Mark. And Paul says, nope. He has been a problem. He has not been loyal. He has not been faithful. And I'm not going to take him along with me. So because of that, Paul and Barnabas, that friction is not fully healed. I, I, I don't know what uh, fully took place there, but it tells us that it was so much so that they separated. Paul went his way. Barnabas went his way. But thankfully, that's not the end of the story. By the time Paul writes Colossians then, he said, we, we get the idea he's a changed man. Because look what he's saying about him. This guy has been a comfort to me. You know, Mark changed. Somewhere along the way, he was restored to usefulness. Maybe it was through the ministry of Barnabas. Barnabas is seen throughout Scripture as being an encourager. And maybe Barnabas just kept pulling him along, kept pulling him along. Maybe it was through the ministry of Peter. If you read it, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, uh, Peter calls John Mark a son. And so maybe somewhere along the line, Peter got a hold of John Mark and said, Come on, bud, let's go. Let's do this. And he, and he encouraged him. And, and, and maybe it was even Paul at some point connected again with him. Because in Philemon, Paul says he's one of my fellow workers. <laughs> Wherever it happens, somewhere along the way, this man who was once rejected by Paul became one of his greatest helpers. In fact, if you notice in 2 Timothy, this is the last one of the last things that Paul writes. And, and, and remember last week I said that... Um, that when Paul got to the end of his life, he wanted to see Timothy one more time. And so he said, I'm going to send Tychicus to Ephesus uh, and to replace you. And, uh, and Timothy, you come to me. But notice what he said there. Get Mark and bring him with you. Why? For he is very useful to me. And it's just unbelievable the change. 
He says, bring him because he's useful to me. The, the, the story of John Mark is an amazing one. Uh, and, 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 and you see in it um, forgiveness, restoration. And, and, and so much so that, you know, there's a book of the Bible written by this guy, Mark. And he was one that his life, uh, you know, I think too often what happens is, as, as Christians is we, we write people off because they as somewhere messed up. And we, we kind of put them off the side. Hey, well, you know, they can never be. Yeah, I'm glad they, you know, came back, but let's stay away from them. And, and Barnabas and Peter and Paul said, no, 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 no. There is a need for people in our church. There is the acceptance of people in our church who have been restored in their walk with God. And, and that is such a blessing because we all mess up, don't we? We all fail. And sometimes some of us are those John Marks who we've given up. We have, we have faltered. And yet it's so good that there's people like a Barnabas and a, and a Peter and a Paul that will say, you're not done. Come back. And, and God can use you even more than he did before. And, and I, I think he's such an amazing illustration of the fact that a believer who confesses his sin, there's hope and there's restoration to serve God again. Third type of person that I want to see here is that the church ministry needs praying people. Look, look at uh, verse 12. Epaphras, uh, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Heropolis. Epaphras is uh, another guy that really there's not a lot said about him, but he was an incredibly crucial person in this church, in the church of Colossae. Now, Epaphras is mentioned numerous places in the Bible, but never in a big way. It's always in a small way, but there's, every time you see him mentioned, Paul always adds a little qualifying statement, a little adjective, and, and things such as this, fellow servant, servant, fellow prisoner, faithful minister. And I mean, over and over again, Paul is saying, hey, this guy is, is such a huge blessing because he serves faithfully. He, he gives of himself completely. Now, he was Paul's representative in Colossae, as, as, uh, as Epaphras is the founder of this church in Colossae. He was Paul's representative, and he sought Paul's advice on how to deal with uh, different uh, things, especially the heresies we've talked about through this book. And, and Paul cared deeply about him, but what sets Epaphras apart is something different, and it's what's mentioned in this passage, and that is that he is a prayer warrior. A giant in prayer. And it tells us here that he knew how to lay everything before God and, and, and labor in prayer. Notice, notice what it says in that passage again. He says he has struggled on your behalf in prayer. He, he struggled before God. He wrestled with God in prayer. Why? What was his reasoning for that? He, he loved this church. He, he, he wanted this church to grow. And he says, Paul, Paul says, he, he, I, don't, I want you to understand Epaphras is constantly praying that you will mature and that you will f fully grow in the Lord. And that you will be fully assured of God. He wrestled. He persevered in his prayer. And I, I can tell you this. Uh, our church desperately needs people who will, will be praying. Are you a prayer warrior? You know, I, I appreciate there are people who, who will say to me, I pray for you every day, and I, I know that is true. And I, I cannot stand up here on Sunday and preach without your prayers. I can't. But we all need to be people who are, are, are on our knees praying before God. Uh, his, his prayers there for, for stability and maturity were, were continuous and strenuous. And he stands as a challenging example of the ministry of intercession, interceding on other people's behalf. And, and like him, we need to wrestle in the agony of prayer. Now, Epaphras is also in, uh, 
uh, commended for something else. And that leads us to the second one. He's, he's commended for being faithful. If you look at the end of the section on him, in verse 13, he says, But I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you. He was a faithful guy. He worked day after day after day, day tirelessly serving uh, in the church and serving the church people. And he, he, he was faithful in that task. It was not just prayer. Although I want to say if all you can do for this church is pray, uh, you are a huge help to this church. But he didn't just stop there. He also labored. When Paul mentions another person I believe is faithful. Look at verse 14. It says there, uh, Luke The beloved physician greets you. Luke, the beloved physician greets you. Uh, Luke is another name that you've heard many times, but really the the amount of detail we have about him is limited. We know he's a doctor. He was Paul's personal physician. Uh, We we know he's a close friend of Paul because we often see them connected. Uh, we know he, he was with Paul on his journey to Rome. We know that uh, because in Acts, uh, when it talks about their journey, uh, and it talks about them being lost, uh, being shipwrecked, uh, it, it uses uh, personal pro, plural, pro, pro, plural pronouns. Like he, he will say, we did this, we did that, and he was the writer of Acts. And so we, we know that Luke was involved in that. We know he was not a Jew. How do we know that? Because verse 11 tells us, in verse 11, you look there, it says, Jesus, who is called justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers. And, and so Paul is saying, here in Rome, there's these three guys, Aristarchus and Mark and Jesus, who were with me. These are the guys who are part of the circumcision. These are the guys who are Jews. So Luke was with him, and so Luke is not a Jew. And, uh, uh, and we see there, uh, Paul, uh, he is serving right beside Paul. It may be that somewhere along the way, Paul got a reoccurring illness where he needed a personal physician with him everywhere he went. Uh, but for whatever reason, he travels with Paul. Now, I'm sure Paul loved having a long, I'm sure having a doctor by his side was a great thing uh, to whenever he had struggles with that. But uh, he, he was a very educated man, so I'm sure he helped Paul in many other ways as well. He was a very smart guy. Uh, I can imagine, you know, Paul was a smart guy as well. I can imagine the type of conversations they had, these two very intelligent men having conversations. I'm sure it was fun. But Luke is, Luke is the first example we see in Scripture, or the first medical missionary we see. Medical missions is something that happens today, and it's, it's a very important and necessary uh, part of the, the mission work. But here we see Luke. Uh, not, not everyone in, in the Lord's service has to be a preacher. And I think we, we need to understand that because whatever God has given you, those gifts and those abilities can be used for God. And, and, and medical missions is an example of that. And Luke, Luke wasn't just about, in fact, we don't see where Luke's preaching. We see Luke just serving. Because God's work also needs specialists. People that have skills. And maybe it's not just a doctor. Maybe it's uh, an accountant. Maybe it's a... Uh, a carpenter, maybe it's an electrician, maybe it's, and the list goes on and on and on, and maybe it's you're a good cook, and we, we could just continue down that list, but God, God's work needs specials, and Luke was surrendered to, surrendered his special talent to God, and probably gave up uh, so much in doing that. Uh, even, in, even in this day, I mean, Luke could have probably done a lot better for himself if he, if he would have just gone into his own private practice. But he gave that up. I believe in return, God blessed him. Uh, Luke is a huge part of our our Bible, even. He wrote two books. But I think Luke is is another example of Paul's companions who was, was just a faithful guy. He faithfully did, he he faithfully worked in the in the in the position God placed him in. It wasn't about, you know, uh, himself. It wasn't about pointing to who he was. It was about the work of God. I mean, he traveled with Paul all over. He went through those hard times. And uh, he wasn't in it for the money. There probably wasn't a lot. He wasn't in it for the notoriety. He's side by side with Paul in prison. 
He wasn't in it for the wrong reasons. If he was in it for the wrong reasons, when things got hard, he would have, he would have abandoned Paul just like John Mark did. But he didn't. I mean, he, he, as I said, he was with Paul when Paul went through a shipwreck. I can imagine hopping up out of that water, that cold water, and going, okay, this is enough. <laughs> I, I've, this, this isn't what I signed up for. This isn't what I bargained for. I thought I was going along with this preacher, and, you know, I was going uh, to make a name for himself. My, my, my medical practice was going to grow because everyone was going to see what I'm doing with this guy. And shipwreck was not something I wanted when I signed up. But he didn't do that. He was just faithful. You know, God's ministry today needs faithful people. People will say, you know what? I'm in it for the long haul. Yeah, at times. At times, your ministry in this church or your ministry for God can be tiring. At times, it's, man, it wears you out. At times, you can think, you know, there's, there's a lot of better things I could be doing with my time right now. But there's not. And, and, and Luke was a guy that got that. And he was faithful. And we as a church, we need faithful people. Next one we want to look at, number five. This is, a, this is the hard one. Church ministry will have deserters of the faith. Look, if you will, at uh, verse, verse 14 again. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Demas just has a very short mention here, and it's, it's not negative. We get no sense here from this passage that anything is going wrong. However, Demas is an example of, of men who can fall. Now, Mark failed, but he came back to God. And, and from what Paul says here in Colossians, it seems that Demas is, again, one of those guys who side by side with Paul during Paul's imprisonment in Rome, at least at least for a while, at least for a, a time period, that's what he's doing. He's, he's serving here with Paul. But then something happened. Somewhere along the way, Demas forsook the ministry. Demas abandoned the ministry, and Deva, Demas left town. Notice what Paul says. Again, this is Second uh, Timothy, and so this is later in Paul's ministry, and it's towards the end of his ministry. He says, for Demas in love with this present world, has deserted me. The, the Greek word deserted there is, is an interesting one. It's not just a simple leaving. It, it, it actually implies much more than that. It, it, uh, it means that he left him in a bad way. That he abandoned Paul and it wasn't pretty. That he had had enough and he went on. Here, Paul was in prison and, and he's, he's facing the death penalty. He's He's ready to die, and, and that's when Demas chose to leave. Undoubtedly, Paul was hurt by that. It's never easy to see a friend and an associate and someone that you have spent time with and ministered who, who forsakes you in the midst of a hardship. And, and this separation that was mentioned was not merely just that he left, but there's more to it. There's more implied from this verse that he left and, and beyond that, though, he, he also left spiritually. What does it say there? He left Rome because he fell in love with the world. He chose the corrupt value system of an unsaved world over what heaven offered. And here, here's the truth. At times, if you're honest... I think we all get it. Here's this guy, Demas, who he saw all, all of the junk that Paul had to put up with. He saw all of the struggles that Paul had to go through, the physical pain, the, 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 the issues of uh, people against him. And, and, and if anyone deserved a good life, it was Paul. Demas watched that. 
And he watched him face trial. And, and, and maybe on the other hand, Demas looked over here and he saw these soldiers who every day came and spent time with Paul. And then they would go home to their, their life. That was much easier. They were rewarded well for their labor. And, and they had what they wanted. And they were well taken care of. And, and, and Demas thought, I don't want this. I want this. And the reality is, is that I think if we're honest that many times that we struggle with that. And many times we've seen this happen. I'm, I'm still a, I like to think anyway, I'm still a relatively young guy. Many of you would say that. Some of you would say, no, I'm an old dude. But I'm still a relatively young guy. I'm in my mid-40s. But just in this, the last 20 years I've been in ministry, I have seen so many people abandon the faith. I have seen teens that I have invested hours and hours and hours into who want nothing to do with God. And they're like demons. They say, no, none of this is worth it. I want something easier and better. I'm not just talking about people leaving this church. I'm talking about people leaving the church. And what lessons can we learn from that? I, 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 think, I think a big lesson that we can learn from this is that we need to be cautious in our own life. I, I, I don't think there's anyone in this room that's exempt from these temptations. And if you think you are, I think you're not being honest with yourself. If you sell out for God, and if you give God everything, at times it's very, very, very challenging. You know, and I, I, I am not one that's, you know, questioning whether or not this is what God wants for me, but there are days when I go, isn't there something better and <laughs> easier? And Demas, though, allowed those thoughts to continue to build in his head and to the point where he said, I'm out of here. And I, I, I put Demas in the midst of this one. I, I, I Really, I could have just skimmed by Demas because it all says is as does Demas. But I felt we need to understand that in the church ministry, there, there, are, there are positives, there are blessings, there are, there are these good individuals that are mentioned. And we have that in every church, but there are also the other ones. And I don't say this so that we begin to look around and go, oh yeah, I can think of this person, this person, this person, this person. I say that so you can think of your own life. Hey, i, I got to caution myself. Young people, that you can say, hey, you know what? I am going to stand by my faith. I am going to hold to my faith, not to my mom's faith, not to my dad's faith, not to my youth pastor's faith, to my faith. Because as I said, as youth pastor, I've seen too many kids, too many kids grow up and be involved in my youth group, go on mission trips with me. I, I could name you kid after kid who's gone all overseas with me to other countries and today has nothing to do with God. Because it was never really their faith. And I don't know if that's the case with Demas. Maybe at one point he had faith in God, but he just got distracted by the world. But uh, too many people, that's the case. I want to challenge you in your own life. Caution yourself. Hey, I'm, I'm going to hold on to my faith. Number six, we're going to look at the next one. We have two more. Church ministry requires people to finish the task. Uh, verses 15 through 17, verse 15, Paul says, Give my greeting to the brothers at Laodicea and to, to Nympha uh, and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you read the letter from Laodicea. And and and, uh, and goes on and say to uh, Ar Ar Archippus, uh, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. 
Okay, verses 16 and 17, I'm just going to go through this and let explain what's going on here. In verse 16 and 17, Paul is just giving them some instruction. He tells them, make sure to greet two groups of people. He says, greet the Laodiceans, which is another town close by, and, and, and then greet uh, Nympha, which is a woman who apparently had a church uh, in her home. He says, greet, greet these two groups of people, and, and then he says to them, and, and when you finish this letter, see a lot of these letters were circular, and, and Colossians is no different. When he finishes the letter, and usually what they would do is they would then transcribe it themselves so they had their own copy, but he said, when you finish this letter, take it to the Laodiceans so they can read it, and then the people of Laodicea, I have a letter for you. Uh, we don't have record of that uh, anymore, but he said, you take that, that letter from the Laodiceans, and you read it as well, outwardly, and then he, and then he follows up with one more instruction. He says, now, I want you to give a message to a man by the name of Ar Archippus. We don't know much more about Archippus. We don't know anything about Archippus. All, all we know is in Philemon, Paul calls him a fellow soldier, meaning that he was a laborer that went with Paul. But we, we don't much know much more than that. But what does Paul tell him? Because I think what Paul tells him is an important reminder to us of what church ministry is. He says in that passage, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. And he reminds him a few things in this. He reminds him, first of all, that this ministry that you have is a gift from God. The ministry that you have, each and every one of you have in this church, is not, is not something you do because you're, you're the best person at it. It's not something you do because you're the only person that can do it, even though that might be the case. It's not something you do because, you know, Pastor Pete, Pastor Nate, Pastor Will came to you and said, can you please, please, please do this? No, you do it because God said, here's, here's the ministry I have for you. And I want you to think about that way. Because if you view it the other way, that this ministry is something that, you know, I got to do because no one else will, or they pulled my, twisted my arm hard enough, I better do it. No, you, you need to think of it as this ministry is from God. If you are a Sunday school teacher, that is a ministry God has given to you. Uh, that's a, that's a, a much better way to look at it. And so he says to them, this ministry is a gift from God. And, and therefore, because of that, we are stewards of the ministry God has given. Just like I'm a steward of the ministry God has given me, you are as well. And one day we will have to give an account of how we did his work. And since the Lord gave us his work, then... The Lord will also help us carry out His work. Ministry is not something we do for God. It's something that God does in and through us. I hope you see the difference there. See, because the Bible presents a radically new attitude towards ministry. Ministry is not something that we do on special occasions. It's a lifestyle of those who follow Jesus. And Paul is saying to this guy, Archippus, he's saying, fulfill the ministry that you have received from the Lord. I don't know what his ministry was. Maybe it was something big. Maybe it was a pastor of a church. Maybe it was something small. I don't know what it was. But he says, fulfill that ministry. And that's what I would say to you. The ministry that you have, fulfill it. Do it. Faithfully. Finish the task. Don't hold back. The word fulfill there means to bring to completion. It's the idea of a completely finished project. Don't hold up and, and finish and stop before you're done. Uh, again, it says there that he received his ministry. It's not something that we choose to do. God chooses us for ministry and he expects, expects us to complete it. The last thing I want you to notice about ministry uh, is... It's a simple one. Church ministry expects suffering and sacrifice. Notice if you will, verse 18. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Now first, I want you to notice, Paul says there that he wrote this greeting with his own hand. Um, as with most of Paul's letters, he probably did not write the entire letter on his own. There could be multiple reasons for that. Some believe that, that Paul had something wrong with his eyes, and so because of that, he couldn't, he couldn't write well. Uh, some people believe that maybe it's because he was in chains. It's hard to write with chains on you. I don't know. Maybe it's just he chose to have someone write it. But most of his letters, he would transcribe it, and someone would write it down. But Paul is telling us because he wanted them to know that he personally wrote this greeting. I think that, that puts a personal touch on it. 
Okay, this is, this is I, I want you to know this last little bit is for me. I specifically wrote this. And, and, and then I want you to notice his unusual signature at the end. And I really think this is a raw statement from Paul. What does he say? Remember my chains. <laughs> now, that's not something a lot of us can say, right? I mean... <laughs> You know, I, I can't get up here on Sunday and say, hey, don't forget this week, my chains. Okay, I, I'm not chained up, but Paul was. And he's saying, remember my chains. There's an uncertainty about that, isn't it? As I've said, Paul was, at this point, awaiting execution. And, and though he is, I mean, he is a, a, a monster of a man of faith. Okay? He is a guy that did so much for God, and at times we look and we see, whew, man, he, is, he has got so much faith that he could serve God despite all this. But yet, he, he's also a real man. And he's saying to them, remember my chains. And I think it's a reminder to them at the end here, to, to, and a reminder to us to remember that ministry is not always easy. There's a, there's a mindset and a teaching out there, and we, we talked about this on, in serve training last Sunday night, but there's a mindset and a teaching out there that if you just have enough faith that, that God's going to give you all, all the blessings of life and that your life is going to be easy sailing and you're not going to experience hardships in life, that, that is baloney. And Paul is saying that here at the end. He's saying, I want you to understand that ministry is hard. Ministry is a challenge. Serving God is something that always isn't easy. But it's worth it. And then he ends with, grace be with you. Even though it's a hard time, even though some of you are going to end up in jail, just like me, Paul says, even though you're going to face all these hardships, he says, just remember, God's grace will always be with you. In conclusion, I just want to make three applications about this passage. There's a lot to... Take, take in, because it was kind of uh, a lot of different things. I just want to give you three applications. First of all, there are the first one is there is a lot of different types of people that God can use. Do not believe the lie that God can't use you. There is a lot of different people mentioned just in this passage that can, God can use. Some who failed, some who were faithful to the end, some who, who didn't have all the talent, some who, who, who maybe were never going to be preachers, but God uses different type of people. And then the second application is all people are valuable for ministry. All people are valuable. We, we, we have, uh, as Pastor Nate mentioned in the announcement videos for a few weeks, we're, we're changing a little bit. We're trying to save a little money, and so we're, we're, we're having people volunteer to, to clean our building. And, you know, I, I sit in my office, and uh, usually it's on Fridays, and I'll hear vacuum going, and I know it's someone who, who, who gave up their time to come to church and do it, and I, and I, and I appreciate that. Okay, it's, it's something I appreciate. And even in that, that's a valuable aspect of ministry. And all people are valuable for ministry. And then the last thing I want you to remember is everyone is vulnerable for failure. We can all fail. How are you serving in this church? This whole study of the book of Colossians has been about growing. And you should be growing in your walk with God, but you should also be growing in how you serve Him as well. There is... No retirement from service for God in God's ministry. Now, God may change what you do, but there is no time where we should say, okay, I've done enough. God wants us to continue to serve all the way to the end. Let's pray. God, we are thankful for your word. Lord, we're always thankful for your word. And I pray that you will help us to listen to your word, to learn from your word. Um, Lord, I... I, I have a heavy heart because I know that maybe there are people in this room right now who are who are battling with demon demis itis. They're ready to leave the faith and they don't they, they don't know if it's if it's worth it. Lord, I pray that you will convict them of that. Uh, Lord, I pray that you will bring them back to you. Lord, maybe there's those here that just have not been consistent and faithful in serving you. Maybe there's those here who, who struggle with knowing what it is that they can do in, in, in our church and finding a way to serve. I pray that you will help them to, to seek out someone that could give them advice on that. 
Lord, if nothing else, I pray that this church will be filled with people of prayer. People who are on their knees pleading with God for you to work in our ministry. Lord, we thank you for all you do. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Please join us in standing together for our final song. This is the word of God, our response to what has been preached. Let's sing.
two ministries will be at 5.30 p.m. Our ethics discussion and serve training will be at 6 p.m. At 7 p.m., our student ministries will be having a smack, and so teens plan on sticking around a little bit longer than usual. This Friday and Saturday, our student ministries will be traveling down to Indy for the Called Out Conference. Please be in prayer for our teams as they travel, as well as for their spiritual growth during this two-day conference. Saturday at 9 a.m., the Iwana Grand Prix weigh-in will be here at the church. Next Sunday at 5.30 p.m., the Grand Prix itself will be held in the gym. Next Sunday evening, our church will also be participating in Operation Christmas Child once again. We'll be packing shoeboxes with gifts in the gospel for children all around the world. Please bring small gifts to pack for a boy or for a girl, or bring gifts for both. Great wow items include a doll, a stuffed animal, a small musical instrument, and shoes. Other great gifts include toy cars, jump ropes, yo-yos, school supplies, sunglasses, hats, and hair clips. Please don't bring candy, toothpaste, gum, war-related items, used or damaged items, liquids, food, or things like that. It costs $9 to ship one of these shoe boxes to a child. If you can help contribute to the cost of shipping, please write your check to our church and designate it for Operation Christmas Child. You can also give online. If you can't afford to cover the cost of shipping for a shoe box, don't worry, you can still participate by bringing in items and helping us pack the shoe boxes next week. Last year, we packed 50 boxes for children, and this year, we want to double that amount and pack 100 boxes with gifts in the gospel. I want to encourage you to set aside next Sunday evening to come out to the church and help us with this great opportunity to get the gospel out to children around the world. Time is running out for you to sign up for a photo session for our new church directory. If you haven't signed up yet, please do so today. If you aren't available to get your photo taken during November 6th through the 9th, Life Touch can help you find another church at another time where you can still get your picture taken and get it in our church directory. If you're interested in this option, please talk to Barb Dudek and she can give you the phone number that you can call and try to schedule an alternative photo session. Finally, if you're new here at First Baptist, we'd love to get to know you more. If you stop by our guest center in the annex, we have a gift for you as our way of saying thanks for worshiping with us. Have a great week, First Baptist.